All right, well, let's welcome up Hutchin Madison. Thanks, Ron. Good morning, gentlemen. How's everybody doing? So far, so good? But it's early, right? Good summer? All right. Anybody need to repent before we get started? Uh, Walter, okay, good. <laughs> Hey, listen, we're excited to be able to be back, and we're starting a new series today. It's going to take us most of the way through this fall. It's called Indispensable, and the reason that came about is, as Ron and I were talking, he said, what would you like to do? And, and I had been thinking at that time, uh, of course, you know, I am a grandfather now, and I know it's hard to believe, especially for those who are watching on camera, that I'm old enough to be a granddad, but I have a 15-month-old grandson, and as I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about my heritage I, uh, my grandfather on my mom's side died a couple of years before I was born. And so I never knew him, but I was named after him. And then my grandfather on my dad's side, I was about 12 or 13 when he passed away. And so I knew him pretty well, but I, I don't know even the names of my two grandfathers, fathers. And that really began to strike me having a new grandson. And I'm wondering how far down the line will my legacy live that people would know me, my family. And so I was thinking about this. What are the things that I would want my children and my grandchildren and my, should the Lord Terry, great grandchildren to know for absolute certain from the word of God that their father, their grandfather, their great grandfather believed? What did God's word teach? And I'm so thankful that we can record these so that they can even hear that in my own voice. But I went on that journey and, and, and we put 10, 10 subjects, 10 topics, 10 biblical truths for a life of meaning and purpose together. And the first one we want to look at this morning is grace. And so take your bifold. You want to follow along with us. We're going to go through a lot of scriptures this morning and hopefully God will move in our midst. Father, we do pray that you would move in our midst in spite of ourselves. Help me to hide behind the cross. And I pray that although it may be my voice that is heard today, I pray that it will be your words. Holy Spirit, do it in this place and in these men and in me what only you can do. Don't just challenge us with truth, but equip us to change where necessary. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible has a lot to say about grace. As a matter of fact, the word grace appears some 150 plus times on the pages of the New Testament. And stop and think about it for just a second. Apart from grace, you cannot be in a right relationship with God. Apart from grace, you cannot live and walk in consistent victory over sin in your life. Apart from grace, you will continually struggle with guilt and shame. And apart from grace, you will always lack joy. The classic definition of grace is God's unmerited favor. But pastor and author A.W. Tozer said this, and I quote, Grace is the good pleasure of God that inclines him to bestow benefits upon the undeserving. Dr. Tozer went on and he said, The grace of God is infinite and eternal. As it had no beginning, it can have no end. And being an attribute of God, it is as boundless as infinitude, end quote. And the grace of God has been made available to all people. Look with me, if you will, at your notes. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for, what does it say? What does it say? Let's read this again and put a little emphasis behind it like you had coffee already. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for? All Thank you. And it is the grace of God that makes salvation available for each and every person. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And the more you and I come to know and understand about grace, you and I will come to agree with former slave trader turned pastor turned hymn writer, John Newton, that grace is indeed amazing. And so this morning, I want you to write these things down. We're going to talk about three thoughts, three truths, three facts, three insights to grace. The first thing I want us to see together today is this. I want us to see together grace 
in a strange place. Grace in a strange place. When we think of grace, we think of it as a New Testament thing. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit expounded on grace in great length in three books of our New Testament. The book of Romans, the book of Galatians, and the book of Ephesians. But I want to draw our attention today, as we take this journey together, to grace in a strange place. I mean, after all, who in the world would ever think that you would find grace all the way back in the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel? In 2 Samuel chapter 9, our attention is drawn to a young man with a very unusual name. His name was Mephibosheth. Now, the meaning of Mephibosheth's name is a bit debated, but it probably is best defined as the one who destroys shame or end of shame. Now, I don't know about you, but when my wife and I were making a list of names for our two sons, Mephibosheth didn't break the top 100, if you know what I'm saying. Maybe in your case it did, but in ours, it wasn't really on the scoreboard at all. And as unique as this name is, there are actually two men in the Bible with this name, Mephibosheth. The first one was actually King Saul's son by his, um, his concubine named Rizpah. And he was killed by the Gibeonites in an act of defiance against the king. And that's recorded for us in 2 Samuel chapter 21. The other is the son of King David's very best friend, Jonathan. Now, somewhere in the middle of King David's rule and reign of 40 years over the nation of Israel, David is reflecting on his relationship with his very best friend, Jonathan. So if you fast forward, or if you go in reverse, about three decades, we see the story back in 1 Samuel chapter 31. You see, the reason David was reflecting on Jonathan is because 20 years earlier, both Jonathan, his dad Saul, and Jonathan's brothers were killed in battle, in a battle with the, the Philistines on Mount Gilboa. It's recorded in 1 Samuel 20, that after David, after Jonathan told David that it was his dad's intent to see that he was put to death, that Jonathan and David entered into a covenant relationship. Look with me, if you will, 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 14. Jonathan speaking, he says, If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord, that I may not die, and do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever. When the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And Jonathan made a covenant with David, with the house of David. As David was reflecting on his good friend, he thought, is there anybody left in the line and the lineage of King Saul that he can fulfill his commitment that he made to his good friend Jonathan with? So he calls one of Saul's servants, a guy by the name of Ziba. And he says, I want you to find out for me, is there anybody living still alive from Saul's lineage? And Ziba comes back to David and says, as a matter of fact, there is one son of Jonathan who is still alive. And David says, well, where is he? And Ziba says, well, he's in the house of Maker in the village of Lodabar. Now Mephibosheth was very young on the day when his father Jonathan and his grandfather Saul were both put to, get, put to death in battle. What happened was very unfortunate. When word got back to his nursemaid, she was afraid for his life that those who had killed King Saul and Jonathan would find out about Mephibosheth and would seek him out to put him to death. And so she was fleeing from the palace. Well, she had a little bit of a mishap and ended up dropping Mephibosheth and it did permanent damage to his feet. He was crippled for the rest of his life. Now in that day and age and culture, if you had some form of a severe injury or disability, you were kicked to the side, even if you were royalty. And so Mephibosheth was hidden away in an attempt to ensure his safety. 
But David now made it his priority to meet with Mephibosheth. But can you imagine what must have went through Mephibosheth's mind when the king's men came knocking at his door? I imagine Mephibosheth had visions of how is he going to kill me? Is he going to stab me? Is he going to cut me in half with a store, with a sword? Is he going to impale me to a wall like my uncle's? Mephibosheth's heart must have been racing. His, his heart was pounding well, on the entire trip down to Jerusalem to meet the king. I mean, Mephibosheth's life had already been filled with a, a lifetime of trials and tribulations. I mean, think about it. He lost his dad and his grandfather on the same day. He was dropped and left permanently unable to walk. He was exiled to a place called Lodabar. Now, I don't know how much you know about Lodabar. I didn't know much about it. But Lodabar means a place of no pasture or a desolate place. You get the picture? There wasn't even any grass growing in this region. So when Mephibosheth is brought into the king's presence to meet the king for the very first time, he bows face down in the presence of his king in complete surrender and humility. But David's response must have absolutely blown Mephibosheth away. Look at it with me, if you will. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 7. And David said to him, do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. All this grace bestowed upon Mephibosheth was to honor a covenant between David and his father, Jonathan. To say that Mephibosheth was shocked would be an understatement. That the king would extend to him such grace when he could give the king nothing in return was absolutely amazing. The second thought I want us to consider today about grace is this. We are all modern day Mephibosheths. We are all modern day Mephibosheths. Now I want to ask you a question this morning. I want you to really think about it. Did you know that God loves you? He really does. You are the apple of his eye. He gets excited. The psalmist said that he even, when he thinks of you, sings and rejoices in who you are. That's how much our heavenly father loves us. Now, like Mephibosheth, all of us are crippled with the disease of sin. And there's nothing we can do on our own to come to God. But God is a God of grace. And the beauty of God's grace is that it is not dependent in any way, shape, form, or fashion on the recipient. God's amazing grace is a gift to you and me. As a matter of fact, the grace of God comes from the very nature of God. God doesn't wait for us to come to him. God initiates the relationship. Apologist and author C.S. Lewis put it like this, and I quote, I never had the experience of looking for God. It was the other way around. He was the hunter, or so it seemed to me, and I was the deer. He stalked me took unerring aim and fired. And I am very thankful that this is how the first conscious meeting occurred, end quote. Just as God seeks us, David sought out Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth wasn't seeking to reconcile a relationship with David. Mephibosheth didn't happen to go by the palace and apply for a job there. The fact is, he was in hiding he was in solitude. He didn't want to be found. And yet it was the king who sought to have a relationship with him. Now, I want you to notice with me this morning, there are three parallels between David and Mephibosheth and you and me and God. The first one is this. Like Mephibosheth, we have all fallen 
we have all fallen. Now, one of the great joys of being a new grandfather is to see my grandson, Wesley, continue to grow. Now, at first, he really didn't do much. He just kind of drooled and gobbled and soiled his diaper and that kind of thing. But we still loved him. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but he's grown out of that. He's began to grow exponentially in his cuteness factor and teeth began to come and, and then he could start to crawl and he went from crawling to walking and then from walking now he runs everywhere he goes. And just yesterday I had the privilege of walking out of a restaurant with him and put my finger down and his little hand grabbed a hold of my finger and we walked down the sidewalk in front of the restaurant. And I thought to myself, I love walking with my grandson. And that reminded me of something that I read way back in the book of Genesis. Way back in the book of Genesis, we read about the fact that Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the evening. And I thought, how cool is that? But then... Genesis chapter 3 comes and everything changed. Satan tempted Eve. She gave in to the temptation and Adam stood by and didn't say a word. And then eventually he too succumbed and partook of the forbidden fruit. And immediately Adam and Eve fell. And the result of that fall was the congenital defect of sin that now separated man from holy God. And every human being since Adam has been born with this congenital sin nature that separates us from God and makes it impossible for us to work our way back to him. As a matter of fact, the apostle Paul put it like this, Ephesians 2 and verse 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. And that's how all of us are. We're all damaged by the fall. When God sets out to redeem us with his grace. Secondly, like Mephibosheth, we are far from the king. We are far from the king. Mephibosheth lived nearly his entire life in seclusion in an obscure village called Lodabar. Now, Lodabar was way over on the other side of the Jordan River, very far north of Jerusalem. And due to the fact that we are all born with a congenital sin nature, we are separated from God, both by nature and by choice. Isolated and alone, we try to live out our existence every day. We have fallen in sin and we're far from God. But thirdly, like Mephibosheth, we're afraid of the king. We're afraid of the king. I mean, have you ever ran a red light or a stop sign accidentally? Every time you see a cop car after that, what happens? Your heart begins to race. Your palms begin to sweat. Because you did something wrong and they're standing on the side of the law. And, and, and all of a sudden, fear is a natural response to a person who realizes that they are a sinner in the sight of a holy God. But it is God's grace that seeks us out right where we are, fallen, far from, and afraid of God. And it's God's grace that seeks us out not to condemn us, but to rescue us. The third thing I want us to see about grace this morning from this story is this. Grace embraced changes everything. Grace embraced changes everything. When David's messengers arrived at the door, due to his disability, Mephibosheth could neither flee nor fight. Think about that. But his affliction may have been the very best thing and been a blessing in disguise. Because if it weren't for Mephibosheth's disability, he may have tried to fight the legitimacy of David's kingship. He may have tried to flee from the king's men, but it is his disability that made it so that he couldn't do anything on his own. But get this, he had to trust the king. And you and I are just like Mephibosheth when it comes to our spiritual condition. Sin has left us spiritually dead, unable to help our own condition. We are totally dependent on the grace of a loving and just God. But I'm so very thankful that God's grace accepts us just the way we are. 
2 Samuel 9, verse 7. And David said to him, do not fear. I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Mephibosheth was extended grace by the king because of a covenant that was made between the king and his father. In the same way, God the Father made a covenant with his son, Jesus. And it is for Jesus' sake that you and I are extended grace. The result was is that Mephibosheth was accepted, lame limbs and all. So too are you and I. The gift of God's grace not only makes us accepted, but we're blessed as a result. Again, look at verse 7. I, that is the king, will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father. David wasn't obligated to do that. He didn't have to. He wanted to. He wanted to bless Mephibosheth, to restore to him all that had been lost, and on top of that, bless him above and beyond. It's a picture of the amazing grace and the heart of a God for you and me. As a matter of fact, let's look at scripture real quick. Romans 8, 32. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also give us all things? Blessed is he, Ephesians 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. 2 Peter 1, verses 2 and 3. May grace and peace be multipli multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine Divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The psalmist said, Psalm 84 and verse 11, the Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God's amazing grace is poured out in abundance through many blessings that are all for our benefit. And the gift of God's grace brings us into intimacy with the Almighty. For the rest of Mephibosheth's life, he sat at the king's table. Now, if you invite me to go out to breakfast with you this morning and pay for it, I'd be very happy. And in doing so, you and I would have some great fellowship together. But in David's day, Sitting at the table meant much, much more than just ha us having a good time together. It spoke of relationship. It spoke of friendship. It spoke of hospitality. And no less than four times in chapter 9 is it reiterated that Mephibosheth sat at the king's table for the rest of his life. Imagine how that made Mephibosheth feel. He was a deposed royal. He was moved into the king's palace. He was treated as if he was a member of the king's very own family. And every night he got to sit at the king's table. Every night when he sat down to eat his meal, he was reminded of the grace and the blessings and the benefit that the king had extended to him. And folks, I want you to understand that when you and I accept the gift of of God's grace. We are given a eternal home and the past is put in the past and we are made joint heirs with Jesus Christ. It doesn't get any better than that, guys. That doesn't mean that life's not coming with its problems, but no matter what you and I face, we can know for absolute certain that God's grace is both available and abundant. Not only is God's grace available and abundant, but know this this morning, it is sufficient for whatever your need is. So whether you're here today and you're spiritually dead, God's grace is greater. If you're here today and you feel like life has dumped on you, guess what? God's grace is greater. No matter your disability, disability, no matter your difficulty, you can face the truth. God's grace is greater than anything you will ever face. We're going to break to the tables, have some dynamic discussion around this group, and I'll come back in a few minutes, kind of tell us a story and pull it all together.
Hey, listen, this verse is not in your notes. Isaiah chapter 55, verses eight and nine says this. You, you probably know this scripture. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And I was thinking of that verse, and I was thinking of this concept of grace. And I think one of the things in life is, is we don't always see God's grace from our perspective. Does that make sense? God's giving us and extending to us grace. But because of the circumstances and situation, it doesn't seem like it. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 9, we read about Paul's conversion. His name was Saul at the time. He was going to persecute the church on the road to Damascus. And God knocked him out of the saddle, literally. Blinded him. So that he was absolutely, utterly, completely dependent upon God. At that moment... That didn't appear to be God's grace in Paul's life. But did you know that the 13 books that he wrote, that we know that he wrote or attributed to him writing in the scriptures, at the beginning of every one of those books, he talks about God's grace. As a matter of fact, it never takes more than four verses, Pete, into a text before he's talking about God's amazing grace. As a matter of fact, look at it. You see it there in your notes. Romans 1, verse 7, grace to you and peace from God. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 3, grace to you and peace from God. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 2, grace to you and peace from God. Galatians 1, verse 3, grace to you and peace from God. Ephesians 1, verse 2, grace to you and peace from God. Philippians 1, verse 2, grace to you and peace from God. Colossians 1 verse 2, grace to you and peace from God. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 1, grace to you and peace. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 2, a grace to you and peace from God. 1 Timothy 1 verse 2, grace, mercy, and peace from God. 2 Timothy 1 verse 2, grace, mercy, and peace from God. Titus 1 verse 4, grace and peace from God our Father. Philemon 1 verse 3, grace to you and peace from God. Do you see a theme? There was a theme in Paul's life that when he got knocked off of that horse on the way to Damascus, it was God's grace in his life. He didn't see it at the time. And then I thought about Isaiah where he said, my ways are, are not always your ways. And, and, and then I thought of some, some, some things in scripture that, that didn't at the time seem like it. Like in Ezekiel chapter four, God told Ezekiel to lie on his left side for 390 days. And at the conclusion of 390 days, he was to lay on his right side for 40 days as a prophecy against the nation of Israel. Did you know that in Isaiah chapter 20, God instructed the prophet Isaiah to walk around naked for three years to prophesy against the nation of Israel. Did you know that in the Old Testament, God told Hosea to go and buy back his wife, Gomer, who repeatedly broke the marriage vows, lived a life of prostitution to show his mercy and his grace. God's grace from our perspective doesn't always seem like God's grace, but God's grace from his perspective is. And and about two weeks ago, I was laying in bed and I was thinking about this message and I was talking to the Lord and the Lord showed me something. He showed me that over 33 years ago, when my oldest son was born, who was born with a disability, who was born with Down syndrome. And at the moment, it didn't seem like God's grace. It seemed in the moment like, God, why? Why would you do this to us? We're just a young couple. We're trying to serve the Lord. We're trying to to do the right things. We're trying to stay away from the wrong things. And here you give us a child with a heart problem. He's got Down syndrome. We don't know what to expect. But I am here to tell you that, that because of the grace of... Josh is God's grace gift to the Madison family. And we didn't see it at the time, but in looking back... Our family would not be the family that it is. And I would not be who I am if it wasn't for the grace gift of a son with a disability in my life. So although we may not always see it, 
you can always know it. God loves you. He's got your best interest at heart. And no matter what comes your way, no matter what disability you deal with, no matter what difficulty you face, no matter whether you get knocked off of your horse and are blinded, God's grace is available, abundant, and more than it's sufficient to meet all of your needs. Father, thank you for your amazing grace. Help us today, Lord, to see with fresh eyes that sometimes grace shows up in a strange place. But if we will allow you to be at work in us and through us, we will see what we don't understand in the moment, that it is indeed you who are at work. And the work that you're doing in us you will in the future want to do through us as we extend grace to others. So Father, thank you for the story of Mephibosheth. Thank you for the truth that we can learn. And thank you for your inexhaustible grace that meets every need and blesses us on top of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Good stuff, huh? All right.